the first Charlie Brown, was an enormous success. It attracted 45% of the audience in its time period. It was just uh, beyond any expectations on the part of the network. After we did a Charlie Brown Christmas, we had done another show called Charlie Brown's All-Stars in spring of 1966, and it did tremendously well. 50 share of audience, there were only three networks. You know, that's a pretty good rating. So we figure we're in the catbird seat. When we went to the networks to propose a third show, the networks said to him that they could do whatever they wanted, but they wanted another blockbuster. They wanted a blockbuster, and if this one wasn't it, they might not order any more peanut specials. This was going to be the supreme test. We we're going to have to have another blockbuster like a Charlie Brown Christmas. And if we you know, can't get something like that, then you know, we may have to stop. And Bill Melendez and I said together, what? Well, I was worried all the time. I said, good golly, who's interested in this kind of nonsense? We all sat down and stared at each other for a few minutes, trying to think what in the world we were going to come up with. So I called Mr. Schultz up, and I said, Sparky, you got to come up with another blockbuster. So Bill Mullins flew up again like he had done with the Charlie Brown Christmas, and we all met and stared at each other, trying to think what this blockbuster was going to be. And we're thinking about something about, uh, you know, about uh, uh, the pumpkin, a pumpkin show. Bill, the animator, said um, Halloween would be kind of fun because we do do all the costumes and the trick-or-treating, and that would lend itself to animation. And then Sparky all of a sudden stood up with great excitement and said, the great pumpkin. Dear Great Pumpkin, I'm looking forward to your arrival on Halloween night. In a Charlie Brown Christmas, we decided to use real children as the voices of the characters, not to use adult actors playing children, as had been the case of all the cartoons before that. With the exception of Lucy, the entire voice cast of A Charlie Brown Christmas returned for the Great Pumpkin special. The reason we had child actors, because I insisted on that. I hated the thought of, of, of hiring adults to pretend that they're children. We're going to use children idea or children voices, get kids. And so that was my, I stood on that very strongly. I hope so. I have my reputation to think of, you know. Sally is extremely important. There are all the big scenes out in the pumpkin patch with Linus. And we'd almost finished her recordings. And her mother called me in the middle of the night and said she's about to lose her tooth. And I said, oh my lord, if she loses her tooth, she's going to have a lisp. So we called the recording studio. It was a Sunday. They opened it up. We rushed her up. She finished her lines, and on the last line, blew her tooth out. And it would have been a disaster if we hadn't recorded her. So after a Charlie Brown Christmas, Vince Guaraldi became our composer of record and would go on to do 17 more shows before his passing. And each time, uh, he would come in with new songs. I would come to him you know, with, with a storyboard or a story. And oh, he could right away sit down and start, you know, thinking of themes and all kinds of, right away get on that piano with his funny little two hands. He couldn't squeeze a whole octave, you know. He would bang it octaves. <laughs> Sometimes it would be a Red Baron theme. Sometimes it would be the Great Pumpkin Waltz. But it was the same jazz as in all the other uh, songs he had written. So as we did each special, he would write new songs to fit the mood of that particular special. In Great Pumpkin is much more somber and often uses haunting flute music to evoke the eeriness of Halloween. The Great Pumpkin was Maybe the second or third show that we worked, you know, together in this project. It was a good project. I loved the story. I loved the whole idea. And I, of course, wanted to do it in the most elaborate and convincing fashion. Melendez had this wonderful team that worked in the traditional cell animation method that is unfortunately becoming slightly extinct in this country now. Bill Melendez, the great animator that he was, was able to take the comic strip and just move the characters. Not change the characters, just make them move even where they walked funny. And there was a seamless transition thus from comic strip to television screen. 
One of the problems that Bill Melendez and his crew encountered in animating Charlie Brown for television is that the characters weren't designed for animation. Schultz had very simple backgrounds in the strip. You know, he was the only person in the world who drew side views of blades of grass because he had always had his camera down low. And Melendez wisely realized you couldn't do that for half an hour on television. You had to take different angles to keep these characters interesting. So he found different angles and different, different ways to frame scenes, to compose shots. It described a lot of great fantasy potentials, the great pumpkin, you know? So I didn't want to destroy that at all. And so we had to pull back from being too explanatory and, and get back to a good be, be, being more subtle and just leaving it more for, to the imagination. I'll hold the ball and you come running and kick it. Oh, brother. By the time we got to the great pumpkin, we started to hit our stride in terms of recording the voices, the music, the color, the, you know, the whole thing. They were able now to give a little more budget, a little more lavish production to it. The animation was probably a little better. The color was a little better. Particularly memorable are the blotchy blue and purple sky while Linus and Sally are sitting in the pumpkin patch and the very evocative drawings as Snoopy imagined he's making his way across no man's land. They had a problem in doing the Red Baron sequences because Snoopy doesn't, doesn't talk in the, in the uh, cartoons. At some point, somebody must have said to Schultz, well, how are we going to do the Red Baron if Snoopy doesn't talk? And he said, we'll find a way. And he found a way. He just let Charlie Brown translate for him. Here's the World War I flying ace imagining he's down behind enemy lines, making his way across the French countryside. But we also had another scene in there for the first time. When we were talking about the kids with the costumes and the trick-or-treating, Mr. Schultz said, you know, it's uh, when Snoopy's fighting the Red Baron when he's a World War I flying ace, he has a nice Halloween-type costume on. It's a shame he couldn't fly. And Bill Melendez, the animator, stood up with great umbrage and flourish and said, Sparky, I'm an animator and I can make him fly. Mainly because we could do it in animation, we couldn't do it in live action or any way, any any other way. That's what made it so much fun to us. That ah, oh, good, we can do this, but they can't. <laughs> and the two of them got so excited about this prospect. They couldn't wait to get to it, and of course that became one of the most famous animated scenes that we ever did. That scene of the doghouse and the bullets flying and the wonderful colors in the background, that's everyone's image of the flying ace. And it's not in the comic strip, it's, it comes from the television show. It's interesting when you look at the peanut strips in sequence, you see the evolution of Snoopy. And there was a major jump when he started walking around on his hind legs. And then there was a major jump when he started adopting different roles and he became different characters. And then one day he was on top of that doghouse, posed in uh, World War I fighter pilot stance. And suddenly the strip just went to a, in a total different level. The Flying Ace is probably one of Snoopy's most popular personas and there's a disagreement in their family about who thought of it, because both Sparky and Monty say, I thought of it, but it definitely came out of Monty's making models and bringing them in to show his father. He came in one day and said, you know, it'd be a really good idea is to have Snoopy fly a uh, World War I airplane, you know, be like the flying ace or something like that. I probably didn't say flying ace, but flying around, you know, fight the Red Baron or something. Oh yeah, okay, <laughs> you know, great idea, <laughs> right, so then, week later, a couple weeks later, he does it on a Sunday page. And then years later, he started saying that he made up the idea. I was like, Dad, why would you say that? You didn't make, oh yeah, I did. No, you didn't. So uh, we went back and forth, back and forth for years, and finally, uh, I don't know, the last few years of his life in some interviews, he conceded the, well, maybe Monty came up with the idea. And it's not like I'm saying I made up the his drawing of it. He made it famous. It came from his imagination. Snoopy as the World War I flying ace has become an icon adopted by pilots in the aerospace industry. The flying ace has appeared as the mascot of a lot of flying squadrons. 
That went a long way. In fact, it became a, a poster stamp, but it went even longer than that because when Apollo 10 named the modules Charlie Brown and Snoopy, the astronauts held a picture of the World War I flying eights from outer space. So, yeah, Mr. Schultz got a lot of mileage out of that one idea. You're wasting your time. The Great Pumpkin is a fake. Everyone tells me you are a fake, but I believe in you. Well, it's a good question about why Linus believes with such dedication, because the great pumpkin somehow lets him down. For the most part, Linus is very steady throughout all the shows and all the strips. But like all of us, he had one Achilles heel, and that was the great pumpkin. In Sparky's mind, it was necessary to believe in your own beliefs and not let the other people sway you from, from it. Here Linus had, had cobbled up this little story that was pleasing to him, completely logical from his point of view, and completely harmless. And it was actually a very nice little story. And people tried to dis disabuse him of it. And he thought, why? Why take that away from him? He's enjoying it so much. And I think that's, that's a parallel to our lives frequently. We all have little things we enjoy that people want to take away from us for no visible reason. And that, of course, became one of the recurring themes every year for 50 years of the comic strip. It was interesting because, again, this the most stable of the characters would blow it every year on the Great Pumpkin. It's the Great Pumpkin! He's rising up out of the pumpkin patch! Mm. So we finished the Great Pumpkin, and unlike a Charlie Brown Christmas, which we thought had maybe failed, we really thought the Great Pumpkin was something. The film was made, and we put it on the air, with quite a bit of advertising and promotion, and much to our pleasant surprise, it just was an enormous success. The show aired October 27, 1966, and received a 49% share. To put that in some kind of perspective, you know, the average, uh, the average rating now is about a six or a seven. Suddenly they all said, oh, I always knew it would be a hit. Uh, there's nothing in television that uh, manages to change the way people treat you than good overnights. By gosh, it was another blockbuster. Once again, we got a 49 share, and there were only three networks, so that means half the country tuned in. So once again, the genius of Mr. Schultz had saved it. The Christmas show and the Halloween show have been playing since the 60s. It's uh, over 40 years. It got to be something people looked forward to year after year after year. This whole idea of the great pumpkin, <laughs> just think about it. What a crazy, wonderful idea. Halloween was a natural, because when you thought of Peanuts, one of the things you thought about was the great pumpkin. I thought it was great. It was my favorite show, and still is. That was the last time we had any pressure. And I think the reason we were successful all these years is we were never under the umbrella of a major studio. Uh, Bill and I and Sparky would meet, and they would work out the shows and develop everything, and we would just turn them into the, to the network which is a testimony to his genius and that people would you know, trust him to that extent.